Well, hello and welcome to our coming out webinar. Um, we're doing a panel discussion to discuss coming out in preparation for National Coming Out Day. If we have not met, my name is Art Pereira. I'm the Director of Community Care here at Revoice. And what that means is that I um, spend half my time providing pastoral care to gay folks and the other half of my time um, helping pastors provide better pastoral care to gay folks, which is a very fun job for me. Very much enjoy it. Um, and today I get the joy of moderating a discussion between a panel of some of my favorite people. Um, some of these names may be familiar to you, others may be newer voices, so I'm going to let each of our guests introduce themselves before we slide into our discussion today. Um, Grant, why don't we start with you? Perfect. Yeah, my name is Grant Hartley. Uh, pronouns are he, him, his. I'm 29 years old. Um, and I'm a freelance writer and editor, and um, right now I'm pursuing my master's <laughs> divinity um, at a school in St. Louis, so. Great. Uh, Timon, why don't you go next? Um, yeah, hi, I'm Timon. It rhymes with Simon. Uh, it's not to moan. You'll be forgiven for having been calling me that in your head up till now. Um, I live in Connecticut, where I'm in a uh, marriage and family therapy master's program. Um, uh, gay slash asexual slash demisexual slash queer. Um, a lot of the language I use depends who I'm talking to and what I'm trying to describe. Um, yeah, predominantly he, him, pronouns. Cool, thanks. Henry? My name is Henry Abuto. I live in Fort Worth, Texas. I am, uh, I'll be 33 tomorrow. So um, what do I do? Oh, he, him, um, identifies gay. I am gay, um, I am very gay. And, uh, <laughs> and yeah, I enjoy running and uh, I cook for a living. So I guess I enjoy that too. Um, and that's all I got. Uh, Bridget? Uh, hi, my name is Bridget. I um, am 32. My pronouns are she, he, they, etc. And um, I hail from the Bronx. Yes. Um, uh, I uh, am a writer. I am the author of Heavy Burdens and a researcher. I do research for um, an institute here in New York City. Uh, and then probably the thing that I love the most is I teach uh, college classes in sociology. And that is, I guess, probably the most rewarding thing that I do. Um, I'm really like, you know, bubbling with excitement about it right now because it's the beginning of the semester and we're just like getting going with all the exciting stuff. So, um, yeah, that's what I really love doing in addition to the research and writing that I spend a lot of time on. That's very cool. And last but not least, Johanna. Hi, uh, I'm Johanna Marie. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm bisexual. Uh, I'm from Florida. Um, and I mean, I'm spending my time right now uh, working with a nonprofit a local nonprofit that works on environmental justice in African American neighborhoods. And I also love to write. So, yeah. Love that. Very cool. Thanks, Johanna. Um, well, we're here to talk about coming out, and I'm going to ask you a really terrible question, which is basically tell us a little bit about your coming out experience, but there's a million of us, so like in two to five minutes. Um, so just some things to consider might be like how old you were, what was like, what was the process? Um, was it very public? Was it a Facebook post, et cetera? Um, yeah, just tell us a little bit about your coming out experience. And we can go in that same order if y'all want to. Sure, yeah. Um, well, I think like most people who get to choose when they come out, um, I chose to, came out, to come out to someone who was not my parents. Um, first, because the stakes, I think, were were lower. Um, I just remembered this recently because I think I blocked it out, but at one point I came out, I think around 16, came out to this random uh, youth minister that I had never really met before when I was at an event, and I was away, far away from most people I knew, <laughs> and so I think I just sort of jumped at the opportunity to talk with someone uh, without having a lot of connections 
uh, I, that was too scary for me. Um, but then the next person I told, and this is what I think of as like my first coming out experience, um, was my youth pastor uh, when I was on a mission trip. Um, and I was full of nerves and I was um, really just unsure what would happen, but he seemed to be the safest person um, I could think of. He, he had a he had a, a goatee and he listened to punk rock. Uh, and so I thought that signals safety for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I came out to him and um, it was a good experience. I think he, um, he was a little confused about what to do, but uh, I felt accepted. Uh, and then from there, it just sort of happened organically. I would come out, um, come out to a couple other people on that mission trip. Um, and then in college is when I really started coming out frequently. Um, I think I just kind of felt sick of being in the closet. So I, <laughs> I tried to come out as quickly as possible. So <laughs> that's, that's most of my coming out experiences. But... Over to me. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think so recently I've been like reprocessing asexuality, which as I was reflecting on the questions for this last night, I was like, oh, I was like 14 when I started talking about like not having attraction to anyone. Um, and so that was interesting because I was like, I think that was technically coming out, but the people around me were just kind of like, oh, it's going to happen. And then either continued to assume I was a closeted gay kid, uh, which they weren't wrong, or continued to assume uh, I was straight, which they were wrong. Um, When I was 18, I came out to my best friend at the time, who's gay. Uh, Like two days later, I came out to our, so it's like winter break, freshman year of college. Um, So two days later, I came out to our campus minister um, and then kind of like shut down for several months. And then like over that summer told like a bunch of my friends and then shut down again for a couple months. Um, for me, it was very like, it was like I would a bunch of people and then like complete radio silence. Um, yeah, uh, when I was 20, I had enough queer friends on campus who wanted to read the Bible but did not want to be hate crimed by straight Christians um, that I then came out to my parents and came out to spend the summer I was 20 just like coming out to as many people as possible and then doing a Bible study for LGBTQ students at my campus, which was great. Um, yeah, I think something in terms of my coming out journey is that it doesn't really stop. You're kind of always coming out to people. Um, but I do, and even like in myself, like now I'm like 24 and it's been six years since I came out for the first time. And I'm like, wait, I think there's more going on here than I knew. Uh, but what I think has changed is that the people in my life are no longer kind of handing these really strong scripts to me. And so when I'm like, actually, I'm more asexual than we previously thought, they're like, okay. And it doesn't have to be like a, like a coming out. It's just kind of a like course adjustment. Okay. I resonate that with that, um, with a lot of what you said in terms of the process. Cause yeah, I came out when I was 18 it was also freshman uh, winter break. Um, so yeah, I was at a New Year's Eve party with a bunch of my high school friends and uh, um, everybody was having just a great time being themselves. And I remember just standing there and thinking, nobody here knows who I really am um, or this part of me. And then so I just left. And the scene, if a movie's ever made about my life, this will be the scene. But um, I text my high school best friend and I was like, hey, there's something I need to tell you because he was at the party, he's like, I was like, but I'm afraid to tell you. And he was like, well, I think I know what you want to tell me, but it's important for you to say it. And then, so he just drove over to my house and I came out to him and we just sat under the Christmas tree and just, he held me while I cried for hours till I woke up the next morning, he was still there. And uh, then I drove over to church, um, my church at the time and I came back home and I came out to my youth leader, um, my high school ministry leader. And then, yeah, then I just came out to a bunch of people and then stopped 
And then I was watching Dawson's Creek um, because I had the DVD set. And I was like, Jack's character was coming out. And so I was like, you know what? This is it. So I watched like someone's whole season of coming out story in like an afternoon. And then so I just mass text everybody. Like I just copy and paste and just texted so many people. And then, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, that's, I'm 33 now. So that was 15 years ago. Yeah. All right. Well, um, my coming out experience is kind of almost a non coming out experience because, um, I can't really say that I ever came out in the traditional sense. Um, I think sometimes coming out is a choice that people make, but a lot of times, for many people, you don't get to choose. Um, You are kind of dragged out of the closet um, for better or worse. Um, And I think that was kind of my experience. I was kind of dragged out of the closet. Um, I never wanted to tell people that I was gay. I never imagined myself ever telling people that I was gay. In fact, when Um, I started having people in my life confront me, um, and, you know, asking me if I was gay, um, I had like told myself that it was a secret that I would like take to my grave, that I would never tell a single soul. Um, and then it was around that same time that people started, um, asking me about my sexuality and questioning my sexuality and, um, I, I had uh, probably the most challenging of, of those experiences was having my pastor, you know, call me into meetings and asking me, uh, basically if I was living in sin with my best friend, uh, and, uh, um, people from my church reporting things to my pastor, like, oh my gosh, Bridget was holding a hand with XYZ girl last Sunday, um, we saw her and we think that's a concern. Um, and so I, I never really chose necessarily, um, most people in my life early on just started kind of pulling it out of me. Um, and when people would ask me directly at first, I would deny it and be like, what are you talking about? I'm not gay which like didn't feel like a lie to me because I like didn't identify that way. Um, But then more and more was like, you know, if I'm really being honest, um, then I, I need to like answer these questions honestly. And kind of at that point, it was like, what does it even really matter? Because they're treating me like I'm gay anyhow. (laughs) Um, So That was my experience. And um, I think that there's a lot of people who in in conservative Christian contexts, many people, you know, choose to come out, but I think many others end up being kind of forced to come out one way or another, not because they wanted to, but because they're being put on the chopping block. And you almost need to find a way to reclaim the narrative that is being placed yeah. upon you. And for mm-hmm. me, the narrative was like, you are living in sin. Um, you can't be trusted. This behavior is questionable. And it was like, for me, like there was such a need to reclaim that narrative that was being placed on me and be like, hold that. up, hold up. Like that, that is not true. Like, let's like take a step back here because what you were saying about me is not who I am. So I'm taking that one. Reclaim the narrative that is being put on me. I'm taking that (laughs) one, girl. Okay. (laughs) Uh, uh, That was good. Bridget, can I ask how old how old you were when all this was happening with your pastor and all that? That was about 10 years ago. Okay. Almost almost a full 10 years ago. So I I'm I'm 32. I'm 32 now, so I was like 22, 23. Yeah. 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 Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Johanna Marie? 
Yeah, so for me, um, there wasn't one big coming out moment um, as much as, well, no, I think probably when I was 18 or 19, I did talk to a friend who would also fit the definition of bisexual, but doesn't identify that way. Um, and it was kind of like, I don't know, I think I want to talk to her friend group about this. And she was like, I'm not telling anyone. And I was like, well, never mind. <laughs> and from then, uh, that's probably the first person I ever put, put it to in like actual words, what I was thinking and feeling. So I kind of just put it in the back of my mind. It was like, well, if we're not talking about it, it, it doesn't exist. Um, and kind of over the few years after that, I did have like, uh, this really like strong like moment with the Holy Spirit where he was the one pointing out hey the sexuality thing we're gonna talk about that we're actually not gonna hide that that's not something you have to hide from me or from yourself or from anyone else and so over that time I did a lot of like reading a lot of online stuff I was very early Tumblr adopter so if y'all can imagine 2011 Tumblr that was lit that tumblr was lit though you had to be there yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> i'm so glad i was too young for that <laughs> i wrote stuff in my graduate paper that several professors were like uh it feels like you've already gone through this program where are you getting this information and it's other grad students sharing information and in, on sexuality and gender and race and colonialism online and, and these study groups and whatever other than but yeah but it was this like basically wanting to learn what have other people who i are experiencing the same thing i experienced going through so of course in this very an last anonymous place on the internet basically safe place um you know I was out there and then eventually I like add stuff to the Facebook profile and add stuff to Instagram and da 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 like that goes like that for years and if someone else says oh yeah and I'm da 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 I'm like oh yeah me too like you know those kind of little it's not announcement I'm not texting anybody that kind of thing until basically and when I finally did find a church I was searching searching for a church during that time it was like five years um, when I did find a church, I did, um, I had already like kind of come to my own theological conclusions about what I wanted and that kind of thing. Um, so I did like, when I talked to the associate pastor, I was like, so yeah, I'm by. I'm not in the closet. I'm not hiding anything. I'm not whatever. I'm also like, um, have these theological conviction, convictions about sexuality. So that's not necessarily something you have to worry about, but also I'm just, this is who I am and I'm not hiding that. So are y'all cool with that or not? Um, and so that happened. And so I was out at church and that was cool. And then like probably a few years after that, I realized I hadn't actually ever talked to my dad. <laughs> so my siblings knew, my friends knew anyone online knew except that he was on Facebook but I definitely kind of blocked my you know, <laughs> I know that's right <laughs> anyone, anyone from their generation or at least limited access to the to all the social media so at some point I really like I honestly forgot like everyone knows now it's it's whatever so it probably wasn't until three or four years three years ago that I was like oh yeah so dad here's the thing <laughs> um, and we worked both worked on a university campus um so I definitely told him like over lunch one day before we had to go like go back to work <laughs> like yeah so just so you know and my two younger siblings are also LGBT um so he had gone through this a while before um mm -hmm. so I was like me too bye <laughs> and then, like, that I really have to like come out to in 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 that very formal way uh but um kind of like y'all have already said you kind of never really stop coming out you meet someone new or you get into a new space then it's a new conversation again so mm -hmm. yeah this thing that y'all have referenced um multiple times that you never stop coming out is so interesting to me 
because I think it's something no one, no one told me until like the day I was going to come out. I, actually, so I, because I was working in ministry, my coming out was like very public. Literally, my mm. church organized a service at which this event happened. Um, so it was like they organized a Saturday worship thing and. Girl, you're right. That was the whole thing. I remember. Right. That. And yes. Henry was kind enough to like organize a bunch of people to send me a video just to like give me some tips and some encouragement, which was very sweet. But one of the things that someone said in that video was just so you know, you never stop coming out. And this is mind y'all, this is 15 minutes before I go out like onto <laughs> stage, like worship is being played. I'm like in my back office watching this video. Henry sent me crying and someone said, Oh, you never stop coming out. And I was like, I am not able to process that right now. Mm -hmm. This is information for like two weeks ago. So I, <laughs> that was the thing that like, I did not know about coming out until I went and did it. And then I was like, oh wait, yeah, this is not some magical thing that now everyone just knows. We kind of keep having the conversations. Yes. Um, I'm curious mm -hmm. what else y'all learned over the next like a few years or the last couple months or whatever, the, the process of coming out, what that process has taught you. Yeah, we'd just love to know. Well, just a note of like, you never stop coming out. I did find, at least for myself, that I had like my default switch where there was a phase of my life where like the default was like, no one knows and I'm not going to tell them. And the people I tell are exceptions. And like, I know everyone who knows that I'm gay. And then there was like, and I remember because I'm fairly analytical, I was like, I think my default is going to change. And I prayed about it. And I was like, yes, my default is changing to where it was like, now, if someone, I don't really have to tell people, I just kind of like, they're like, you're gay. I'm like, correct. Um, uh. but, but now like the default is that I will be open and honest about my sexuality. And so even though I still have those moments where someone's like, do you think you'll marry a woman? And I'm like, what a weird thing to ask a stranger. Um, <laughs> like there are still people that I have to like disclose to, um, but it's it's a very different context. And so I think those big like terrifying like the worst is playing and you're crying and you're like I think I like boys. Those do stop. There is a light at the end of that tunnel. Yeah, I think that's really helpful to remind people of. Thanks, Simon. <laughs> yeah, I I resonate with that. I think in college for me there was a there came a moment where i thought i don't want to have to keep doing this mm -hmm. <laughs> and so i'm just gonna make it as clear as possible i'm just gonna be comfortable and um i think there are still moments like in the initial conversations with people where i have a choice to reveal a detail or move a certain way or say something a certain way to give them many signals. And I very intentionally do that, but that usually happens like in the first conversation, the first few minutes of a conversation, because I don't know, I just, it felt really claustrophobic for me to have to continue to like tearfully share. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like I'm struggling with, like, I just, I didn't want to have to do that. So. Yeah. There was a moment for me too where like the default the default switched yeah Don't, bouncing sorry. oh no go ahead go uh, ahead no, henry no go ahead okay well yeah. i'll like go really quick and then you go because <laughs> i want to hear what you had to say um but bouncing off of what you just said grant um i think that and and also time in what came to mind as the both of you were talking was that I definitely reached a point where I stopped caring about the assumptions that people were making about me. Um, and so it became at that point when I stopped caring, um, it became less of this like hurdle that I had to overcome in coming out and more like, well, you know, who cares if they know if I'm gay or not, like, whatever, I'm, I like barely know them anyhow, like, you know, all I see, I see them once a week, like, you know, what do they, you know, whatever, um, whereas previously, that would have been such a thing that weighed me down, um, I reached a point where I was like, you know, the most important people I've talked to about this, mm -hmm. um, the people that um, I've invested time and relationship into and they've invested in me um and then the others like if 
you know, they'll figure it out eventually. Um, and if they don't, well, you know, maybe it's because they're living under a rock. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Need to get out a little more. <laughs> um, but like, that point of like, it's not my responsibility to tell every single person in my life that I am queer. Mm -hmm. um, that is like not something that I need to carry around all the time. Like that is mm -hmm. like something that ultimately other people can figure out and like does not necessarily need to be named. Mm -hmm. um, and that really, that I guess helped me so much to just kind of like move on with my life and like let go of needing to like, I don't know, control how I come across to other people mm -hmm. and control my reputation. Um, because like, I, you can't really control what other people think about you. No. You can control who you are um, and like your own choices in life. But at the end of the day, you can't control what other people think. And so for me, a big part of the process was learning to kind of let go and just live my life. Yeah. That's exactly what I was going to say in terms of like, once I got to the place where, okay, I can't keep having this conversation over and over. So I'm like, all right, let me just transition in. Like, actually, what you think about me is none of my business anyways. You're going to think what you're going to think regardless. And so it's like, you know what? Let me release myself from that. Yeah. So mm -hmm. once I kind of just took a step back from like, this doesn't always have to be the narrative or the conversation I'm having repeatedly. But then I don't mm -hmm. know if y'all experience this weird thing. Sometimes you feel like, you need someone to know you're queer just so like for example I was thinking about it like I do hot yoga and stuff like that and then so if like somebody says hi or something and then they don't figure this out about me right away like if it's a guy or something then like three weeks down the road it's like oh something happens that oh they found out I'm gay and I'm like well they think I've been lying to them for the past three weeks or I've been in this yoga class or did they think I was trying to do this and then I'm just like oh it's exhausting that that way I'm just like I'm gay, gay, gay. I say it out loud quickly. Like, so you just have all the information at hand and you can do that what you want. But like, yeah, mm -hmm. I hate the feeling of like, which is like, and I even think part of that is probably internalized homophobia to where like, I'm mm -hmm. so afraid that what this person's going to think if three weeks from now they know that I was gay and what that there is that going to change their view over the past three weeks of just interacting when I've literally just mm -hmm. been myself. And so I don't know if y'all experience yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, sometimes yeah. it's helpful though. Like whenever I meet a woman, I don't know, for instance, I like try, <laughs> I come out as quickly and as clearly as possible, just so we know like <laughs> the dynamic. That, like uh, if, I, if I meet a woman in the park and like, I don't know, men have problems, have creepiness problems. That's like a culture wide creepiness yes. male problem. I like compliment her jewelry or something yeah. <laughs> like, like just just so you know something <laughs> like, safe yes yeah. <laughs> I've voiced none of the friends before just so I can be like hey girl um yeah so I'm on my way just as I pass a woman like sometimes it's not even a real voice <laughs> just to, like give her the feeling like that's a game I want to behind you that's amazing <laughs> <laughs> she says she need to pick up anything at the store <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I, um, That's awesome. I think I found the like coming out to yourself um, kind of what that's kind of I think what I've internally called that like reaching that point of equilibrium where you kind of don't where you're out to yourself you don't really care what other people think um, to be really important particularly as a bi person because I think I do think there is more of in um, a bi person who's fairly gender conforming most of the time but sometimes not but like and not often enough that people genuine there aren't a ton of cues for people to pick up you know so whether it's signaling to someone that i'm a safe person so hey i'm i i'm 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 here too where we're in the same family or it's signaling to someone oh you're saying something wild right now <laughs> you're talking about me too like that I feel like those natural cues just aren't as acute. Um, so I do find it a little more important sometimes to make it clear, but I feel like that, um, 
that's been important, but I, I also really resonate with what you were saying, Bridget, about like, it's not from a place of like trying to control your reputation, which is something that has, that you really do have to release. Um, and it's hard to do growing up in the environment that we've grown up in, fairly conservative um, environment that just didn't have an idea of how to love or care for LGBT people. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to let go of, but when that's released, it's easier to discern. Is this a moment that I need to say something because this person clearly doesn't know <laughs> that they <laughs> are talking about me here? Or, you know, being able to, you know, um, build community and be that person that other people can come out to. Um, having stayed in some more conservative, not as much as I grew up with, but more conservative churches, being that older person, because now I'm like 35, God. Um, but now I'm someone college students are like, oh, there's a person here who is not straight. And that's super important for, to me, for other folks to know. I'm here, I'm safe, I'm someone you can talk to and I will advocate for you. Um, so being like having that conversation is still somewhat important to me, but it comes from a totally different place. Yeah, I'm, um... I love um, that you're bringing this up Joanna, because um, like I have a similar thing where sometimes like I want people to know that I'm queer, like for the sake of like making those connections. Um, and that's like, that I think is one of the biggest things that you gain by coming out is that like there, while there's the risk of losing community, um, there's also the possibility of like new community and new family that is so much easier to access and find because um, now you're recognizable to others that are like you. Um, and where, you know, you might have been invisible before to others that have shared your experiences. Now it's like you can be seen and you can be found. Um, and that makes such a huge difference. And also, um, Henry and Grant, um, I love what you shared. Oh, and Timon, you also talked about this, um, about like not wanting to come across as creepy men. I have like the reverse of that where... Um, my whole life before, um, like there was like, before I was out as being gay, um, like men would often interpret me as being very flirtatious because I'm the type of person where if I see a beautiful man, like, I want to talk about it and I want to tell him <laughs> because I'm like, yes. wow, like, look at you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I like, mm. and I would just love telling him and be like, that's great. And I would often like, just, you know, feel um, a very like, um, kind of like an affinity for other men in terms of like developing a brother sister relationship with them. Mm -hmm. Um, not in any kind of romantic sense, but just like, Hey, I like you and like, we get along. So like, let's be buds. And like, also like, Hey, your outfit looks great today. You look really hot in that. I'm just want to say, <laughs> and like, you know, like before that would come across as like, so flirtatious. Yeah. Um, and I would unintentionally make like, completely unintentionally lead guys on um, not even realizing what I was doing because I was yeah. just being myself and just blurting out what came to mind um, but it would cause a lot of problems whereas now that like there's this like I have I'm able to be open about my sexuality um, there's like more of an understanding of where that sort of thing is coming from um, and it's not coming from this like place of like wanting, wanting to flirt with you um, but it's coming from a place of like hey like I'm your friend and like I'm here to like just affirm you and like let you know that you are an awesome person mm -hmm. um, and that I think is just very valuable um, because when you're closeted I don't think you realize how many walls exist in your life in terms of relationships um, that you are able to form and the closeness that you can have with other people. Um, and there is just like such a like freedom 
that comes with like letting those walls down and all of a sudden like you discover the like capacity to have relationships that you had been closed off to for so long so I think that's like a big thing that I can definitely say I appreciate a lot um, about being out and being open about my experience with sexuality. You know, y'all are actually addressing a question that I hadn't thought to ask, um, but I think is really relevant here. Um, I do a pastoral training program, and one of the things that I get asked all the time is why someone would want to come out especially if they hold to traditional sexual ethics so like me i'm celibate why why do i feel a need to tell people that i'm gay if i'm celibate um and i always think like oh there's so much you don't understand about the experience a queer person is having of the world when you think well if you're not dating it doesn't matter because there's all these other social interactions that are affected by that data and y'all have named Mm -hmm. just a few of them but like my Mm -hmm. capacity to compliment a woman and for that to be received with safety um i was a groomsman in a wedding once and it was the bridal party had six women six men and i remember this one woman pulling me aside at the end and just saying hey thanks for being a really safe presence for all the bridesmaids like we all felt better having you here and like what was happening there is that the the fact that I was a gay man in that space like helped to serve as this platonic bridge between the guys and the girls and helped to establish safety for some of the girls when they needed some company and that was really cool and it was a thing of like oh that would not have happened a few years ago when I felt all the pressure to be closeted Mm -hmm. that was a gift I got to give and a sincere interaction we got to have that if I was like in my head watching all my cues we would have had these really jilted social interactions Mm -hmm. what advice so this is coming out for um national coming out day and typically this is a day that people might use uh, to come uh, to come out i mean y'all have seen the facebook posts Mm -hmm. um y'all have seen people talk about hey came out to my uncle today came out to like a family member came out to this church person what advice would you give to someone who's considering coming out who's like oh maybe i will do this this year maybe this is the year Mm -hmm. and they're like emotionally preparing themselves or they're weighing out the options right like maybe they're not sure And um, I'd especially just want to ask, are there things they should consider um, and things to be careful of? Um, Grant? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm trying to think of what I needed to hear. I think think that's, well, this is a side note, but that's a gift of, of, being a queer person is that you get to be the person that you needed when you were younger. Um, you know, I love that quote. Beautiful. Yes. Um, I think everyone gets to do that, but I think um, queer folks really understand that um, bit. But what I would say is, I mean, one thing I'd say, there's probably a million things I'd say, but um, it's not oversensitive of you to think a lot and be really intentional about who you choose to come out to and when you choose to come out. Um, I know that uh, my experiences are universal and most of my experiences coming out ended up being really good. There were a few few bad experiences, but I've mostly forgotten them, (laughs) to be honest. Um, So I, I don't know the exact experiences in your life, but uh, for some people, there can be real drawbacks and dangers to coming out to people or in certain spaces or in certain times in your life. Uh, so it's okay to, to wait to be sure um, and to find the right people to come out to, find people who, are, who you feel safe with um, and to come out at your own pace. Mm-hmm. People who are safe for you to come out to will understand. <laughs> Um, so you don't have to feel pressure. I know I can speak, I, I, I tend to think of coming out as like a, a death and resurrection metaphor. That's just, that's my whole thing. Henry knows I talk about this all the time, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> but that can end up putting pressure on people to come out quickly, um, or to come out in a certain way. And, um, I don't want that pressure, um, to weigh down on anyone. So, uh, there are plenty of ways that you can come out in smaller, uh, more intimate settings. 
uh, that that could be safer. I know there's there's opportunities to come out um, in virtual environments that are a lot safer. I know um, Revoice has a lot of those those smaller env uh, environments. I I know a huge lifeline for me was like a private online group, um, and it allowed me to feel comfortable before. Um, yeah. Well, I was already out at the time, but it allowed me to feel comfortable online before I was before I needed to be comfortable outside. But yeah, so that's some of what I would say. Also, you're so brave. <laughs> you're so brave. I, I just I want to say I love you to this unnamed person um, thinking of coming out. You're so brave. I'm so proud of you already. Thanks, Brent. Yeah. And I think just to kind of like emphasize what you've said, Grant, I think that if you are feeling like really nervous and really anxious about it, it's just in general, often a helpful idea to like, in terms of like the people that you are closest to in life, starting like at the bottom and working your way up, mm. then starting at the top of the pyramid. And that like, that seems like the reverse order of how it should be. Um, but it can be really, really scary to start with someone like say your parents um, or I don't know, your pastor. Like that is like really scary. Um, and like, if you start kind of like lower down, um, it can like kind of like give you a little bit of a warm up, almost like kind of like practice runs to like get you ready for like some of the people that are like more intense in your life. Um, and a lot of times there's opportunities like what you mentioned, grant online groups um, that are virtual, um, you know, meeting people through um, opportunities like that um, where there's not as much at stake for you in your relational life. Uh, it just kind of gives you practice with it and gets you more comfortable so that when you do have that conversation, that's like, you know, all the way at the top of intensity, um, you at least aren't doing it like completely without um, any like experience previously to kind of like lean back on. I would say advice to someone who is considering coming out. Um, like Timon said earlier, it does get better. It really does. That sounds so cliche, but like there is a light at the end of that tunnel that time, uh, time I was talking about. Um, but advice, do not come out to someone in a setting you can't get out of, like a car. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. it's like, I came out to my mom in a car and she didn't say anything. It was so awkward. And it was, it was me, her and her friend. And we were running errands or something. And I said it, then my mom didn't say anything. And I was like, did you hear me? She's like, uh-huh. And I was like, it was a very uncomfortable hour in the car. <laughs> so if you're going to come out, somebody you're unsure it's going to go, be in a setting that you can remove yourself from if you need to. <laughs> but, um, and then also, <sighs> gosh, I'm trying to think of like what I needed 15 years ago when I was coming out. Um, also, I think gives, for whatever reason, people's reactions when to when you come out have nothing to do with you at the end of the day. They really doesn't. And so give yourself permission to detach from people's reactions to you coming out. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's wise. I think one thing's there for me is that for those of you who might already have one or two people in your life who know that you're queer, like planning ahead to connect with them after coming out with someone is super huge. Um, often we do this terrible thing to our bodies where we make ourselves really vulnerable and we don't plan safety for post vulnerability. Um, and that's just a great way to live in an extreme amount of stress. And so a kindness that we can give to ourselves is to offer ourselves safety and comfort after vulnerability. Um, especially if you're coming out to someone who you're unsure what their reaction is going to be, then like 
for me, um, my best friend knew. I did the opposite of what Bridget said, which was I told like the most important people to me first. Um, <laughs> my best friend knew for a while. And so often I would come out to people on Thursdays because Thursdays were when I saw Nick. And so I just would know that like, okay, Thursday night, I can afford to go through this terrible thing if it goes bad because Nick's going to have my back after. Um, and I can't tell you how many times I showed up to his house and he already had a pint of Ben and Jerry's and was like, what's going on? How'd it go? So that was really pivotal for me, just having a support to operate from, even if it's just one person. That's good too. Any other thoughts y'all for someone who's considering coming out? I have a couple, but Johanna Marie, do you have any? No, I, I feel like for the most part, y'all have touched on what I um, So one that came to mind for me I think we have this narrative that like coming out is like the end goal of a queer person's existence. Like that is like the capstone of what it means to be gay. But I think what I'm, I was just like picking it up as a thread that a lot of us have touched on is that we, like once you start doing it, you realize this is actually a tool. It's not the goal, it's the tool that gets me to the goal. And the goal is living authentically and well in the community mm. that I love and I'm part of. And so, <laughs> I think that's just like something I remember like before I started coming out like I had these you know I was gonna like volunteer to go on a missions trip with my church and then volunteer to do the missions report and then come out at the end of the missions report get to the parking lot immediately drive to the airport fly away like that was like my fantasy um and I didn't do anything remotely like that because that's a really ineffective use of coming out with the tool but it gave me that kind of like emotional catharsis of like that would be like the capstone moment um so I think that's just something is like, this is a tool. And if it's a useful tool for you, use it. And if it's not a useful tool for you, don't use it. Um, don't come out to your mom because you wanna have a conversation about grief. If you need a conversation about grief with your mom, do that. And so just like take that reflection when you're saying, I really need to come out to this person and say, is this the tool that's gonna actually get me where I wanna go? Mm -hmm. um, I feel like there was something else, but that's that's been the main idea. So. Yeah, I think there's a question there, Timon, of like, why are you coming out? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's important to ask ourselves because I think in some communities there's a pressure to come out. Mm -hmm. And I, I actually can remember back to four or five years ago, I had a friend who was gay and was kind of pressuring me. And on, often, like at times, I felt like it was unkind and un insensitive to where my life was at, mm -hmm. um, putting a lot of pressure on me to be out because I was a church leader. And so like as a church leader, there's all these people I could be influencing. And like, yes, like my favorite thing about being an openly gay man is that when I go to church on Sunday, there is a 15 year old queer girl who I know feels more comfortable at a church since I started attending. Mm -hmm. And I will intentionally sig signal or like come out to people more often because I know that 15 year old girl is gonna have like safer spaces and conversations. I will go have conversations with the pastors because of her so that like, she's just gonna have an easier time that's great i'm in a place to do that and i praise god for that um but at the time i wasn't and at the time it was my income was tied to it and um, now i work for revoice so my income is tied to sexuality in a whole other way um and so like i it was such a risk and it was this person really asking me to just be willing to lose my entire income overnight if that's what it took um, and so I just want to like encourage people to think through is is this for you, because it really should just be for you. Um, if it's not right for you it's just not right right now and that's okay if there's ways it's going to cause more risk more stress more anxiety in your life, I mean honestly the goal of coming out is to diminish those things to be able to live as the person that you are. Um, mm -hmm. So I just think that's a big thing to consider is if is, if, is this for you right now, mm -hmm. and it's okay if it's not. I I want to add to that art because I think this like brings up the really important um, point that coming out does not mean that you have to come out to everybody. Mm -hmm. Like first, you don't have to come out if you don't want to, if you don't feel ready. And second, you don't have to come out to everyone just because you came out to some. Mm -hmm. um, still to this day there and like 
my entire life is like out online. I've written like a whole book that is out there for people to read. Um, and yet there are still some people in my family that I have not come out to. Um, like when I um, went down to Puerto Rico, um, like a year and a half ago, um, like my grandmother doesn't know that I'm gay. Um, none of my family down there, like, you know, when I went over an aunt's house, a cousin's house, like, like, it's just not a thing. And I don't feel as if it's actually going to serve me, um, that it is the right tool to use Timon's word, um, to, um, foster those relationships in my life. And maybe one day I will, maybe one day that will feel like the right thing, but like, I just, know that it's not and there's no point in doing it and um it's not going to like actually make a difference in my relationship with those people at the end of the day um and so you know and might actually make it more difficult um and so you don't have to come out to everyone like you can have people in your life that you don't come out to um and that's okay um and it's not that it's not like you're lying or hiding things or anything. Um, it's just, we all have parts of ourselves that we share with some people and not with others. And that's just natural. That's mm -hmm. normal. Um, and you can choose to do that when it comes to sharing this aspect of who you are as well. Mm -hmm. Bridget, that's a really good point in terms of um, you get to choose like, like when you're coming out, whatever's like, okay, everybody needs to know this and whatever. And sometimes looking back, even now, I'm just like, I wish I hadn't shared that part of myself with that person. Um, it's like, or they shouldn't have had that access to that information. I didn't owe them that. You don't owe anybody anything about your life or your story. But I think queer people, when we want to come out and be known and be seen and be loved, we can almost feel this pressure like, all right, well, I got to tell everybody that I'm not actually gay. No, you're gay because you're gay. <laughs> like, <laughs> you telling someone not telling someone does not make that any less true. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, that was a good reminder, Bridget. Yeah. You know, I had a similar thing, um, Bridget, with my family. My family's all in Brazil, my blood family. Um, and so for a while, I was publicly out in America and just would not post anything online because all my aunts on Facebook um, and frankly, there are so many cultural considerations there that I just was not ready to navigate yes. because I'm Brazilian American and like so detached from some aspects of my home culture that I'm not ready to navigate coming out to all my Brazilian family members when there's like way more machismo in some parts there, um, way different, like it feels more polarized, um, like the concept of celibacy does like is not even a valid thing, even less so than in the States. Um, yeah. and so like, that was a choice to be like, okay, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Not because I don't care about my family, but like, there are actually less tools to communicate this than there were to my American friends and my American friends were exhausting enough. Like with my family, mm -hmm. we literally don't have the language. My Portuguese is just not good enough to get there. And there are more cultural barriers than there All are right. in the States. All right. I remember when you were going through that and I was fascinated by that because as someone who's also from a different culture living in America, it's, uh, that's the whole and I want to touch on that real quick if we have time but the whole cultural differences and coming out and because like I remember one time uh I came out and so I was already out so one of my cousins who lives in Kenya or he lives here now but anyways so he saw it and he sends me a text he's like uh there's no such thing as gay Kenyans like that's an American thing you picked up <laughs> and I was like gay people exist outside of America <laughs> but and then I was like oh my gosh like do people back home and I was like yeah if they figure it out they figure it out but it's not a space I'm willing to step into culturally with my Kenyan background because like you said yeah the language just isn't really there for it um and the cultural understanding of it is just like wait what and so yeah um then even just in black community it's just like different versus like white community just with the cultural aspects of it and so um yeah, and I think those of us who are racial minorities who have a lot of pre like predominantly white friends, which is totally mm -hmm. my experience. I grew up in a like predominantly white community. Um, we have to be aware that when we hear our friends' stories of coming out, ours will often not be similar. Um, so well. <laughs> because there is like other <laughs> cultural considerations happening that are just so much. I'm not gonna say more complicated and like 
y'all like half the people I talk to who have church trauma are white. So like I recognize it's hard for all of us, but there yeah. are other complications that exist there that do not come from white American suburban culture. Yeah. And when those of us who either like are immigrants and now live in the States and then most of our friends are white Americans or just live in a different sort of community, um, we can't compare experience right across the bat and we can't take that advice necessarily because the the way the levels of communication even just like frankly um cultural expectation of are you going to provide a child um like i'm an only child and being a latino who's not giving my family a sense of continuation was much more of a thing than i expected it to be mm -hmm. um and like continues to be the most grievous part of this for my mom and so just like understand that your home culture will have some deep implications on what this looks like yeah yeah and also oh no go ahead joanna <laughs> well no uh to add to that art like i to be honest that's something i still think about um so i have two older siblings and two younger siblings so one of five but technically only one of my siblings has a kid right now and i think before i came out that was kind of and particularly i started talking about celibacy and that possibility, what that looks like. Um, there, the, I was kind of, I feel like every Christmas it would be like, oh, well, I guess it's gonna be Johanna who's gonna, you know, continue the family line, da 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 da. And it's like, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> maybe not. Like, there's, uh, <laughs> and that is something that I, that I wouldn't even say necessarily my family. Other than those like comments, they didn't put on me, but something that I have had to like really pray about and because mm -hmm. I have been surprised to find I have feelings about not being the one to like deliver the five children, the five grandchildren that my yeah. father wanted. Um, I did want to go back to something time in, to time in the, to the coming out as a tool. I also really do believe in the closet as a tool if you use it. Mm -hmm. um, mm. Mm -hmm. there for me those five years where I was basically by myself learning reaching out researching to the point that by the time that I came out to people a I was not conflicted about my faith mm -hmm. I was not conflicted mm -hmm. about my identity mm -hmm. when I came out to people it wasn't an I'm going through something it's this is who I am and you can take it or leave it and I was able mm -hmm. to do because by the time I came out, I was already, I had done a lot of work in understanding faith, sexuality. Mm -hmm. You asked about chills when you said that the closet is a tool if you use it correctly. Love that. If you, if you find yourself not ready to come out right now, that is a, we've already said that's a okay. But I would encourage you to read and research, learn, listen to the stories of LGBT people from the past, listen, find other uh, LGBT people of faith, really hash those arguments, those points where you're conflicted with yourself and with the Lord. And if you have someone that you trust to go to for wisdom, go to like include that them in that process, but that time to yourself to really mm -hmm. with yourself and with the Lord to really like, who am I? Where is this going? What does this mean for me? um really establishing your understanding and your identity i i feel like a lot of ways in a lot of ways that has been a big part of what made my story so different is coming out mm -hmm. at a like coming out after having done a lot of this conflicting work of resolving conflict internal conflict mm -hmm. by myself and i really want to encourage people to take that time if they have it that's so wise because I don't know about y'all, but every time I come out to someone, they have an opinion. Mm -hmm. And so when you haven't done the work, then you're so susceptible to just being carried by everyone you talk yes. to. And not yes. everyone wants your best. A lot mm -hmm. of people want their agenda. And I, I don't like to yes. use the word agenda when we talk about sexuality because we all hear it enough. But like, there are people who insist that I get married. There are people who insist that I never even look at a man. And mm -hmm. like a lot of times they are using me as a tool in a political conversation. Mm. And if i hadn't spent a few years i mean johanna honestly like that was a healing thing for you to say because i'm going oh wow god protected me in the years i was in the mm -hmm. closet like god prepared mm -hmm. me for Chills. more public work because a lot of times we rush to the coming out portion and then 
like the, the first person is going to come along and just argue you into whatever their political goal is mm-hmm. and we have to be mm-hmm. careful with that yes Ooh. yeah you've been trying to talk oh yeah you should be legit oh i didn't have i don't have anything to say anymore just like affirming <laughs> all of the things being said right now <laughs> i mean yeah those last couple of minutes that was fire of this conversation that was good yeah okay joanna with a word <laughs> Yeah. What What you said, Joanna, was so, so wise. And I think um, for me, what what that immediately connects to is, yes, again, all my thinking of the closet as, as a death and resurrection metaphor, but like a unique Christian insight into spirituality is that the very places of death can be the places where God does the most miraculous work. Won't he do it? And if the closet is that place of death, that doesn't mean it's a purely negative place because death for the Christian is never just death. Death always leads to life. Yes. And so okay. that closet, <laughs> like I I think most people experience the closet in some sense as a tomb um, where there is no life. <laughs> and that that experience is true, but the longer you spend there and the more aware, aware of yourself you become, you start to realize perhaps that God is there too. Mm. Mm. Um, or you can realize that God is there too. And then it ceases to be a prison um, so much as it becomes a place of intimacy. Like mm. you, can, you can really draw on that experience in the closet, even after you've left the closet mm-hmm. um the closet can become something really beautiful mm. um the tomb becomes a garden the closet becomes like um this this space where you can meet one-on-one with god so i mm. i just i really appreciate what you said thanks so much mm. and i think just to pull like because like practically it was like what uh advice would you give someone considering coming out and what this is connecting for me and art was like, I'm, you know, he was like, my past self is being healed and I'm like feeling that and like crying a little bit. Um, but I know so many queer people who feel like they came out too late. Um, mm. And what's been so interesting to me about that is like, I came out at 18 and I feel guilty that I came out too late. It would mm. not have been safe or appropriate or healthy for me in any way to come out before I did. I kind of came out too early and I have this internal sense that I did it too late. And as I've started being in, more age diverse queer spaces like I start encountering people who came out in their 50s in their 70s in their 30s like you know like significantly later than 18 and they feel like they came out too late um and so what I just really appreciated from Johanna Marie saying is like no like if you're sitting here being like I need to come out and I feel like I'm too late like I'm already too late like how can I wait longer uh, like actually like the waiting is holy the waiting can be holy if you're doing it with god um and what's important is is obedience and is faithfulness and i don't know now i'm just thinking about grant's metaphor and like jesus spent three days in the tomb it wasn't just like heart stopped and then god was like never mind but there was time there that was weird and confusing and scary and sad for everyone um so anyway you're not too late the yeah. only sermon I remember from my evangelical Christian college was our pastor saying the words, do not resent seasons of preparation. Mm-hmm. And I think for a lot of us who are trying to rush out of a closet, there's a question here of, is this a season of preparation? Who scheduled a church service today? I got chills. <laughs> I'm like literally sitting in this kitchen just with chills. But <laughs> well, listen, when I picked the lineup, I knew it was coming. That was good. <laughs> I'm like, this is like healing for me just even having this conversation. Yeah. All right. I got to keep things moving. Um, Any final thoughts there? One just really practical note, get a pessimistic friend and get an optimistic friend. And when you're you're saying, I want to come out to my parents, you need someone to look you in the eye and say, what are you going to do if they withdraw all financial support right now? And you need someone to look them in the eye and be like, bro, that's not how it's going to go. So figure out what you're by. Like I'm the pessimistic friend for so many people in my life, which means I strategically find the optimistic friend who says, okay, but what if the beautiful thing happens? What mm-hmm. if you do the scary thing with God and the beautiful thing happens? Uh, but also just get like really practical. Talk about money. 
talk about finances, talk about emotional energy. Or you talked about like Nick got you ice cream. I like, I know so many people who wouldn't think like, oh, I should ask my friend to bring me ice cream after I come out, but do it like that level of practicality. Uh, like put it in your budget. Like I need a, you know, $5 a month to store so that I can treat myself when I come out to someone. Um, just get super into the nitty gritty and it will pay off. Yeah, that's super wise. All right, we've got to, um, we're going to try to wrap up in the next 15 minutes because we've been going for a while, but I also want to address a few more things. But the last thing, we're touching on this topic that we cannot get into, so I will not let us, but I need to address um, because I am, it's my latest soapbox. But um, eventually we're going to have a webinar and I'm just going to call it Not Your Gay Hero because there are so many of us <laughs> who feel the pressure to be the gay hero for our church and to rescue everyone around us from the pain of sexuality and from the confusion they're in. Um, and I just want to say that some people are called to that. Some people are called to write books and some people are called to be speakers. I happen to be someone whose full-time job is literally that. And I feel like God has called me to like the sort of like front lines work in sexuality and faith. And I have met people who feel like they're disappointing me when they're not doing that level of work in their local church. Mm. And I always tell them like, you're the person we work for every day. Like you're the person I go to bed at night and think about is the person who gets to go to their church on Sunday. They're openly gay. They don't answer anybody's questions. They serve on the worship team. They like, they don't educate people. They hand people an FAQ they print it out online and they say, go pay someone else to teach you. Like those are the people I do my job for. Um, and like, coming out does not have to mean teaching your pastor how to pastor you. You can refuse to teach your pastor how to pastor you. And like pastors who are watching, I say that with all love towards you, but I was a pastor for, for multiple years. We are paid to care for our people. They should not have to educate us on their shepherding. Mm -hmm. All right, now you know you're wrong for saying we keep bringing up the topic, but saying we can't get into it. We can't. You know? We can't. <laughs> we can't. There will be another webinar. There will be another webinar. But there are people because, frankly, most of the people on this call cannot say that about themselves. Half of y'all are like fighting your pastor every Sunday, um, <laughs> or like writing books or anything. What we need is to learn from the people who do not do those things, and I have them in mind. But they won't do this webinar. You know why? Because they don't do those things. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like th this is this is a thing I just want the people listening to know you can choose to come out and you do not have to be an expert mm -hmm. it can be just enough that you needed people to know and mm -hmm. like listen there are resources I'm going to name them right now and then I will put them in the links to whatever this is when we release it but like tell your pastor to go pay posture shift tell your pastor to go talk to Kaleidoscope tell your pastor to call me at Revoice like tell your pastor to go talk to people who are professionally trained at this and then to care for you. You deserve that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's um, good job. Come on now. Now, that said, what can we offer to <laughs> pastors and straight folks who do want to do well when someone comes out to them? Now, and I, I think this is likely to happen more and more as National Coming Out Day becomes a rhythm. There will be people who come out and in October, pastors and churches need to be ready to receive people. So what would you want someone to know if they're watching? They're like, hey, how do I love my friend well when they come out to me? Or how do I love my parishioner well when they come out to me? Um, I'll just jump right on that one. Um, do not make it about you. I can't tell you how many times I came out to people and it, all of a sudden we're having a conversation about their feelings and their desires and their, I was like, wait, like, how am I like now emotionally helping you when I'm the one that brought something to talk about? And I think just because we live in a heterosexual world where all these things are centered around that, they just center themselves without even having to think about it. Straight people just do because they're the center of things, like when we're talking about sexuality most often. And so, yeah, advice, if someone comes out to you, and even if you're unsure how you're feeling about it, be gentle, do not make it about yourself, listen, and then thank the person for sharing that, that deeply vulnerable part of their life with mm -hmm. you, so. I, I would also say, uh, don't make it about sin. Um, mm -hmm. don't, don't assume that this person is sharing this with you because they're trying to confess some kind of deep sin struggle that they're having and they need your spiritual guidance to overcome. Um, I, I run into that a lot, especially from um, Christians who are in leadership positions. There's this automatic assumption that like, oh, 
like they're, they're struggling with sin and I'm the one who needs to help them overcome mm. this. Um, and that's not necessarily the case. I would say probably it's not the case. Um, and I think that a better, a better um, mindset to come from is that um, this is not an occasion for sin in this person's life. This is an occasion for beautiful things to come out of this person's life. This is an occasion for God's grace to be made known in this person's life. Mm. Um, and I can say from personal experience that it was the responses that showed that kind of mindset that were um, the, uh, the most encouraging to me and the most helpful to me. When I came out to my sister, um, she had the best response out of anyone that I've ever come out to in my life. Her response was, wow, Bridget, congratulations. That was her <laughs> response. Congratulations. And uh, honestly, like that felt so good to have someone recognize what a, not only a big deal this is, but that this is a positive big deal that this is a good big deal um it it is not something that needs to be defined by the potential for terrible things in my future but rather something defined by the potential for wonderful things that god has for me mm. in my future um and that i think has been the most meaningful to me when i come out to others um Something I've been thinking about Bridget at the beginning, talked about people like calling the pastor, being like, Bridget's holding hands with a girl. Um, and I noted it because almost exactly the same thing happened to me. So my advice for pastors and straight people is, did the person actually come out to you? Because if you saw them looking gay in public, they did not come out to you. If you saw not them looking gay in friend, public. They did not come out to you. If a straight person called you and said that they think this person is gay and that's bad and you need to do something about it, they did not come out to you. Your straight congregant is sinning against them by gossiping. Deal with the sin problem that's actually happening. Um, and also, it, there, there are exceptions. If they show up to your church with a pride flag on their bag, maybe they are coming out to you. It's appropriate to ask some questions, maybe. Um, but I just think sometimes straight people think someone is offering up a part of their life for discussion or debate that's actually not being offered. So just like take a breather, take a moment of self-reflection. Are they coming out to you or are you just being given access to them that you haven't earned and aren't sure you know how to use well? I just want to chime in there. There's tons of cultural considerations to whether, like I, I know a church that had the exact thing that happened to y'all happen where a bunch of people reached out to this pastor because these two guys were holding hands in church. They're brothers. They're from an Asian culture where brothers hold hands. <laughs> and so these guys got called in, which, I don't, you know, that we probably ideally would, we would not call them in in the first place. But what was happening was they were brothers. And so there's so much happening there about how people show affection and things like that, that just it's just not ours to speak into necessarily and that we quickly make moral when it's not. <laughs> um, any other tips for someone who, uh, how someone can respond when someone comes out to them? Yeah. Um... One of my favorite um, names for God in scripture was given to God by Hagar in Genesis. And Hagar calls him El Roy, um, the one who sees me. Mm. So when someone comes out to you, they are giving you an opportunity to image God and that you have an opportunity to see them. Mm -hmm. So that is an opportunity for you. <laughs> um, it's, it's not an opportunity um, for you to, to take from God the things that belong only to him, and that's judgment. Mm. Um, it's to image him in a way <laughs> that he wants you and has asked you to image him and that's to yeah. see people. So um, mm -hmm. I think that's the prime thing is, is to, to take what people say seriously mm -hmm. uh, and take what they say at face value. <laughs> Don't like assume that it's, it's 
they're saying one thing, but they really mean something else or assume that you're the best interpreter of what they mean. <laughs> um, it's really just like listening skills, but yeah, it's an opportunity for you to, to be one who sees them. Um, I think if, if, you know, if someone's watching this, then they're probably already doing a little bit at least what I'm about to suggest, but this is encouragement to continue. But before someone comes out to you, looking up resources from not just from Christians and not just from Christians who agree with you, but really doing your own study as a pastor, as a leader, as a carer, as a shepherd, um, to familiarize yourself with language, familiarize yourself with experience, with a broad array of experiences um, so that you can have some idea of where people are coming from without assuming, but just having, uh, having some idea of what the landscape even is. Um, and having a way to learn if there are questions you want to ask, learning what are the good questions. Um, so just an encouragement to, to continue doing that work of learning and making sure that you're reaching beyond just the people who agree with you theologically. Like there is still a richness of knowledge and understanding um, to understanding the whole experience from many people. Also, let's be honest, a lot of queer people who don't agree with us theologically used to or grew up in these environments still. So they still have perspective um, to add to mm -hmm. how do we understand this experience? Yeah. And what's the history? The, the one thing I always tell pastors um, and just anyone who has someone come out to them is um, name your love, name your love, name your love, name it, name it very clearly, name what your relationship is. Um, don't assume, oh, they know I care about them. No, we don't in that moment. We truly don't, especially if you're um, a religious figure, especially if you're my small group leader, especially if you're my mom, honestly, I don't know at the end of this conversation that you still love me. Um, I have had like, all of us have seen it go wrong for our friends. Um, and so tell me with like, leave, leave me with no doubt about how you feel about me. Even if you go, wow, I really have some feelings about this. And I like, my mom wasn't ready to not like have grandkids and she needed to work through that. That was fine. Like that's okay. But like end it with like, I, I obviously I have some things to think about, but I just, what I don't doubt is that I love you. And what I don't doubt is that I'm glad that you're my child, that I'm glad that you're part of our church, that I'm glad that you're in our small group. Um, also, if you can name specific gifting they have, that goes a long way too, because it helps you connect them to like seeing pastor sexuality into their whole person. And so, hey, I'm, I'm just so glad you're part of our church. Do you notice these incredible gifts you offer us when you're here? Um, do you know that you ask the best questions in small group? And I wonder if this part of your life has given you some depth because of how you've had to wrestle with God. That would just be such an affirming thing for your small group member to hear when they come out to you. Um, and so naming that you love them, naming your specific okay. relationship and that it's still there that has not changed and um, delighting in something beautiful about them, will just let them leave that with so much. And you can say, obviously there might be other conversations. Like you can, you don't have to like have everything tied up in that conversation. You do have to remind us that we, you still love us. Yeah, because yeah, you're right when thinking through that, because like I'm having those hard conversations. That can be applied to any hard conversation you have with a friend. It's like, all right, man, we just have this fight or we have this conflict or there's this big topic to talk about. It's like reassure the person that you still care for them. Like that's a kindness you can give someone. And it's like an extra 10 seconds, but it means so much in that moment to someone who's afraid of what your reaction was or how much is courage and just like honor how much courage it took them to bring that. Yeah. Um, I have one last question for y'all, um, and that is, we've talked about this a little bit, but there's just a variety of reasons that someone watching may not be able to come out. Uh, maybe you're watching this and you're like I was, you were in a ministry job um, and you will lose your financial income. Um, maybe you live with family and you're unsure how that would go. Um, that's a real risk. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I've was brought to my mind recently is the level of cultural consideration here. Um, I recently spoke with an Egyptian American individual who is openly out in America, but has to be extremely careful when they go back to Egypt 
and they will intentionally never post about sexuality on social media in case family members or anyone else from Egypt sees that because of the significant level of risk, even legal risk they could incur. Um, and so there are just so many reasons someone watching, especially considering we have people who engage with us from all over the world who may not be able to come out um, I wonder if there's any solidarity or comfort that we can offer them. That always breaks my heart whenever I think of people who are in positions and places where like they can't come out. And I get so mad and I read the reasons why I'm like, oh, your parents are complete jerks because if you came out, they'd kick you out or something. It just breaks my heart. So I don't know what practical advice I could say on that topic because it's not my experience, but it's just something that whenever I think about, it, it makes me mad and just breaks my heart so much. That yeah, yeah, I think we can offer love and solidarity for sure. Yeah. Um, I would just remind that God does sees you, that that experience is not how God feels about you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. To go back to Grant brought up the story of Hagar, and for me, for that five years that I was kind of just by myself contemplating sexuality, that was one of the stories that I just read over and over and over again. And the whole story where she leaves early, and then the God is kind of like, "Go back," <laughs> and you're like, "Wait, to slavery? <laughs> what?" <laughs> and then later does in fact lead her out of that situation. Um, maybe even meditating on those chapters and seeing how God sees us in the middle of awful circumstances, trying circumstances, places where other people don't see us and don't understand us and can't humanize us, and knowing that he is with us every single step of the way. Like, it is not him who is distant from you, even if other people can't handle really seeing you and really knowing you. I, I would also say, um, I think that a really hard part of being in a situation like this is that you are surrounded by a narrative about who you are mm -hmm. um, that is not true. And mm -hmm. And in many situations like this, a big reason why you can't come out is because the culture that you're in, the people um, that you're around um, have a belief system, have a narrative about people like yourself that is just not true. Um, and that can be very suffocating to live in um, because you have um, this story being told about yourself every day. Um, that can wear you down, um, mm -hmm. that can make you feel really worthless. Um, you know, you get up in the morning and you put on the face that you know you need to put on in order to be accepted by your world. Um, but inside you are um, feeling destroyed every day. Um, inside you are feeling beaten up every day. Um, even as you put on the face um, to get by and you put on this mask to get by. Um, and so I would say first and foremost, um, find avenues in your life where you can have the truth about who you are spoken um, into your life, mm -hmm. um, where these stories that are being told about you um, that are being, um, you know, pressed upon you from all sides every day can be corrected, can be pushed against and can be challenged so that it's not just you against the world. Um, there are other sources, um, in your life. Um, and, you know, uh, maybe, um, that's books, maybe, um, that's online resources, um, Maybe that's friends virtually that you can connect to. Um, all of that comes with risks of being found out. Um, but if you are able to access those things, I think that can be such an important way of like speaking truth into your life um, so that you can remember who you are before the eyes of God. 
um, and not the lies that are being told to you all the time. Um, and, and, and lean upon those truths, the truths of who you are, um, that we know to be true in God's word and not the lies, um, and the stories that exist within your context. I think something tricky about answering this question is that by being able to be on this call, we are no longer qualified to know the answer to this question, right? When the question is, what do people who can't come out need? We're on a call about being gay and being pretty in public about it. I mean, gay in the umbrella sense. Um, but so I think some of my answer is like, if that's you, like if you're a person who is not able to come out or come out as publicly as you want, there are so many people and resources that are for you that are already on your team yep. um, who are fighting for you. But like, we are just taking our best guess because to be able to fight, we have to lose touch with the parts of ourselves that know what you need. And so the reason I say that is that if you can find ways to tell us, we will fight for you more effectively. And like Art was saying, like, you don't have to be the gay hero. Like there are people who have been called who want to be the gay hero for you. That God was like, you go fight for these people and they are faithful to that call and they want to do it. Um, you just have to tell us what you need. And so you can make an, a fake Twitter account that doesn't have real information and DM people. You can email Art, you can, um i don't know gay pen pals i would love a gay pen pal club i'm sure it exists um <laughs> like there are if you can find ways to tell us we and that and that's kind of what i mean it's like the comfort or solidarity we can offer is like there's kind of a blank check but you have to fill it in um and as you find ways to do that we are going to try to be listening well and we are already trying to figure out what it is that will care for you but we may not be getting it right. And we want that feedback. Yeah, Time, and thanks for naming that. I think that's one of the things even for, I mean, my role at Revoice is so tied to providing care for this exact community. Um, and like, please feel free to email me. It's art at revoice.us. Um, we do have online care groups. Uh, if you are watching this and you're like, help, I live at home and I'm, you know, in my, I'm young adult and I can't afford to lose housing. Well, there's like an online group for 18 to 25 year olds. So there are resources we're creating. Um, and frankly, we're constantly thinking about where we put our resources next. Um, so emailing me about needs, even if I can't do anything about them now, it's great to have them on our radar. It's just like, first of all, a way to pray for you, but also a way to go, man, as we pray about where to grow, even revoice as an organization, but frankly, a lot of us and our friends are people who do this work through writing, um, through online. I mean, frankly, some people are here on here are Twitter warriors, and I mean that in the best <laughs> way, um, who show up every day and go to bat on Twitter and genuinely see shift in people's hearts over Twitter because of threads they make. And so we praise God for that. And also, um, like Timon's right, you're the person we're advocating for. Um, yeah, any other thoughts, y'all, for that? person who's just like, man, this is just not my ear for this. I, I think the biggest thing I want to communicate to that person is you have not failed anybody. Um, no. There is a weird pressure in the community to like be out. And especially I think in the church, it's like, oh, if I, even when I say like, oh, I love that I get to advocate for the 15 year old girl in my church, God has called me to that in this season. I am at so much lower risk. There's so much privilege in being able to do that. Like y'all, I'm literally paid to work for a LGBTQ organization. Like I am at so much lower risk than the average person. Um, live with someone who's very supportive of me. I have tons of emotional support. Like I have privilege that I can leverage in being able to offer care and pave a way for that 15 year old in a way that a lot of people cannot do. And you do not need to be pushing yourself or pressuring yourself to be something in your church or in your community um, that God has not called you to and that would risk you significantly. And so free yourself of that. And um, yeah, there's no one that you're failing in this process. I think for me, there was a certain kind of pre coming out daydream. I referenced this earlier, but just this kind of like really big, really climactic, like you come out, people cry. Um, I just want to say that's not real. That doesn't happen, at least has never happened for me. And I actually think that's a good thing. Um, and now, like, I just moved, and as I moved, I felt myself drop back into these, like, really big, like, climactic goodbye. Um, I think they accomplish a certain kind of emotional catharsis, and that's okay. It's okay to be like, I want to dream this dream of a big moment, and then I'm free, and then it's great, and then it's beautiful. But just, like, engage that as a dream, 
and know that like if you actually had that opportunity you probably wouldn't want it because it probably wouldn't be a good idea you're probably doing the things that are like getting free is going to look like being faithful in a lot of small steps and so you are probably doing more of that already than you feel like you are well y'all um unless you have any final thoughts i want to thank you for your time y'all have been such a joy um i like i said i i selfishly picked my dream team because I was like, these are people who will make me think and um, who will probably make me cry. And that happened. So good job. Um, for those of y'all watching at home, um, I just want to say that we are with you. We're for you. Um, and if you're getting ready to come out or if this is just not the time or if you're trying to offer care and support someone who's coming out, um, we love that you are part of our people. Um, and we love that you are thinking through and praying through what is good for you in the season. Um, and we love that God is for you.